On July 31, 1807, Ms. Thomasina Goddard was carried to her final resting place within a burial vault overlooking the Caribbean Sea on the Isle of Barbados. Situated on the grounds of a church cemetery just above the coastal village of Oystens, the plain, compacted coral and concrete vault was sealed by an enormous block of blue marble that required the efforts of as many as seven men to move. It is thought the vault was originally constructed by a Mr. James Elliot in the year 1724, whom, despite an undoubtedly considerable investment, never used it. Whether Miss Goddard was a relation of Mr. Elliot's or had simply paid for the privilege of the vault's use is uncertain, although there is some evidence to suggest the vault was, in the intervening years, acquired by the Waldron family, of which she may have been associated. Regardless, Ms. Goddard's wooden coffin was set into place and the vault was dutifully shut. Several months later, the vault was purchased by the Chase family. Out of respect for the deceased and the reality of limited space on a small island, Ms. Goddard's remains were left undisturbed. Despite this thoughtful gesture, Colonel Thomas Chase, plantation owner and patriarch of the family, was not a kind man. He had a reputation for being tyrannical with both his slaves and children, making his will known through the business end of a whip. Fortunes would begin to turn against him in early 1808, however, when his youngest daughter, two-year-old Mary Anna Maria, met her end. On the 22nd of February, Mary was placed in a suitably sized lead coffin and carried down the steps into the family's newly acquired crypt to spend eternity in peace, or so it was thought. Mortality reared its ugly head once again in the summer of 1812, this time claiming Dorcas Chase, Mary's elder sister. Though few suspected anything out of the ordinary in the death of a two-year-old, possibly due to the ever-looming threat of cholera and tropical fever, the death of a seemingly healthy teenager was cause for considerable public rumor. It was, in fact, widely believed Dorcas had died via self-imposed starvation in an effort to escape her father's unbridled cruelty. As the men carried the girl's coffin to the vault and muscled the giant block away from the entrance, they received a bone-chilling fright. Thomasina Goddard's coffin had been overturned, tossed against one of the walls by some unknown force. Even more disturbing, young Mary's coffin had been flung to the corner opposite its original resting place and was now standing on its head. There was no indication anyone had entered the tomb in the previous four years. Indeed, considering the size of the marble slab that obstructed the entrance, the idea seemed nonsensical. With understandable apprehension, the Negro slaves set about putting Ms. Goddard's misplaced coffin more or less back into its original position and hurriedly laid Mary's little lead box atop her sisters. In a twist of karmic justice, Colonel Chase met his own fate barely a month after his eldest daughter, very likely by his own hand. But any celebratory feelings born at news of his demise were tempered by a sense of dread as the family vault was opened once more. Undoubtedly, a sense of relief washed through the eight pallbearers when they discovered everything the way it should be. The colonel's sizable coffin was hefted into place and the crypt was sealed. Any sense of normalcy evaporated on September 25th of 1816 when the vault was opened for the coffin of 11-year-old Charles Brewster Ames, an ancillary member of the Chase clan. Their worst fears confirmed, the pallbearers saw the coffins had been cast about the chamber once more, including that of the most recent resident, Thomas Chase, a not inconsiderable feat considering its size. The men hastily righted the coffins and closed the entrance, gripped by the fear of some unseen malevolent force. By the time the vault was opened the following November in preparation of admitting Samuel Brewster, another family member being transferred from the St. Philip graveyard a few miles to the north, word of the strange goings-on had gotten around the island. Despite a swelling storm, a sizable crowd had gathered in the graveyard, hoping to witness something strange. Certainly the men carrying Mr. Brewster's coffin were hoping just the opposite. Gasps of terror filled the stale vault air as torchlight cut through the darkness. Once again, in violent disarray, the five coffins now had numbered four, as Thomasina Goddard's had been bashed apart from either contact with one of the walls or one of the other coffins, left in a broken heap. Ms. Goddard's remains were bundled and tied as best as possible and left in a corner. As before, the rest of the coffins were repositioned, Mr. Brewster given a place among them. Before the vault was sealed, a thorough search was conducted, the walls, floors, ceiling, and nearby grounds checked for signs of forced entry. 
The search was fruitless. How could an intruder possibly enter the vault unseen? The only way in was to push aside nearly a half ton of marble, an arduous task even for the strongest group of men. Despite their obvious fear, it was widely suspected the island's slaves of vandalizing the tomb. After all, many of them knew firsthand of Thomas Chase's brutality. Perhaps they wanted to rob the corpse of a hated man of any lasting peace. As a precaution against further trouble, the massive entrance block was moved back and cemented into place. Over the ensuing three years, the Christ Church Cemetery became something of a local curiosity. Visitors to the sealed vault, a constant sight, all wanting a glimpse of something ghostly. Macabre wishes were eventually fulfilled as death claimed yet another victim associated with the vault. Thomasina Clark, daughter of the original occupant Thomasina Goddard, was carried to her final destination on the ironically sunny and bright morning of July 17, 1819, in a simple wood box. Within the graveyard, a throng of people had gathered, some accounts estimating as many as a thousand. Even Sir Stapleton Cotton, first Viscount Combermere and Governor of Barbados, attended the funeral, bringing along two other government officials as witnesses. As the governor, the officials, and the masses of onlookers watched, a pair of masons broke the cement seal and a team of slaves dragged the block away from the vault entrance. The little room was in a total shambles, every coffin having moved. Impressed, if not a little unnerved, the governor took charge of an impromptu investigation, and again the vault and grounds were searched for any sign of unwarranted entry, though as before, nothing was found amiss. Once the coffins were put back, sand was spread over the floor of the vault in a thick, smooth layer in the hopes of catching the footfalls of any future intruders. Once the entrance was closed, the governor impressed his seal into the wet cement as evidence against tampering. In April of 1820, speculation about the vault had reached a fever pitch across the island, and after a lengthy debate, it was decided to satisfy the public's curiosity. The governor, along with the Honorable Nathan Lucas, Secretary Major Finch, the widower Mr. Boucher Clark, Mr. Roland Cotton, and the Reverend Thomas Orderson, gathered the necessary men and set to work. The cement was broken away, the official seal impressions still intact, and the great entrance slab was maneuvered aside. All of the coffins had in fact moved, Little Mary's having hurtled into the side wall with such force that it chipped the coral. Though the sand showed no signs of being trod upon, sketches were hastily made in the hope that some explanation might be gleaned, and once again a careful search of the vault and its environs was performed to no avail. Finally, the governor ordered the coffins removed and buried elsewhere, the Chase Vault never to be used again. The story of the Chase Vault was first published in 1833 by Sir J. E. Alexander in Transatlantic Sketches, and subsequently throughout the 19th century in books of collected folktales and Caribbean history. It is tempting to dismiss the Barbados story as bait used to reel in tourists. Indeed, the idea that virtually unsubstantiated claims of a 19th century haunting are totally reliable seems ridiculous, but many of the claims do have a connection to reality. Surprisingly, the story of the Chase Vault has changed little throughout the years, though a few details have crept in and out of the narrative. For example, the first resident of the vault is not always claimed to be Thomasina Goddard. Some versions indicate that James Elliot, the man for whom the vault was originally built, was indeed the first body interred, with or without his wife Elizabeth alongside him. But this seems doubtful, particularly in light of the fact that every source that claims the Elliot's interment also claims their coffins to have mysteriously and conveniently vanished. To the more discerning mind, this spooky fact comes across as a highly contrived fiction. There is a church on the hill above Oystens, with a substantial centuries-old cemetery in the appropriate location, home to several burial vaults, also of considerable age. The church in question has, in fact, been in place in one form or another since the late 1600s. A search for specific individuals yields little results, though admittedly Barbadian burial records are not complete, certainly not for those performed over two centuries ago. The names of Chase, Goddard, Clark, Ames, Brewster, and variants of such are all to be found on the island both contemporarily and currently, and as one would suspect from the typical narrative, the Chase family was, at one time, quite sizable, and at least in records since 1875, has often had deceased members buried within the Christ Church parish. That the island was home to plantations of sugarcane, as well as tobacco, indigo, and ginger, is without dispute. It is entirely plausible, then, for the Chase family, a family of considerable size and presumably influence, to have operated one of those plantations. 
A monstrous institution such as slavery often breeds monsters, and the cruelties allegedly perpetrated by Thomas Chase are not hard to fathom, though they do seem somewhat cliched, an easily believed impetus for ghostly mischief. Though it seems a little far-fetched, it is actually reasonable to believe in the participation of Sir Stapleton Cotton, who was indeed governor of the colony during the appropriate period. And although some records indicate he did not attend the funeral of Thomasina Clark and only insinuated himself on the final 1820 opening, it would hardly be out of the realm of possibility that personal curiosity drove him to show up for the former in an unofficial capacity. Aside from the actual movement of the coffins, none of the events described are hard to believe or even atypical. Of course, the only reason we know about the Chase Vault is because of the unusual goings-on. Obviously, if we assume the tale to be objectively true, some force must have been exerted upon the vault in such a way as to not require direct access to the interior. There is the possibility that a group of men clandestinely opened the vault and vandalized the contents, but this seems wildly remote, especially when considering possible suspects and the likelihood of witnesses. Since the mystery, at least the more credible parts thereof, revolves around the coffin's movement and not their disappearance or opening, grave robbing doesn't seem to be a motivation. The only individuals capable of both opening the tomb and having the singular desire to upset the contents for only the sake of spite were the island's slaves, who indeed numbered in the thousands. The common belief that slaves were responsible is in doubt once one considers their universally superstitious nature. The one constant among all the versions is that the slaves did not want to voluntarily enter or even approach the vault, their fear at the situation growing more palpable with every funeral. Once the vault's unusual nature became widely known, it is doubtful that any group of men, however steely nerved, could have hoped to approach the vault without drawing attention, even at night. So if not slaves with a vendetta, who or what caused the coffins to move? And there is no way to definitively determine if the force in question was supernatural in origin, though many have attempted somewhat more fringe explanations. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, world-famous creator of Sherlock Holmes, believed the coffins moved via strange residual powers within the bodies of those who had died before their time, such as the Chase Girls or that of Master Ames. Writer George Hunt suggested, rather than restless spirits, volatile gases from the decomposing bodies were actually responsible. He theorized that when combined with the perspiration from slaves, a bizarre stoichiometric reaction occurred, blowing the coffins into their new positions via explosion. That such a reaction would necessitate the reformulation of every known law of chemistry would somewhat count against its likelihood. Could the coffins have floated into their new positions? Although heavy, a lead-encased coffin is essentially a large hollow box, and, like the great iron ships of the sea, can be buoyant enough to float. And though the vault was well constructed and fairly watertight, the cut coral and concrete structure was likely porous enough for seepage. Though the vault's hillside elevation of about 100 feet might preclude collection of large amounts of water, Barbados, like all islands in the Caribbean, receives as much as 90 inches of rainfall annually, much of which arriving in violent bursts via storms. Enough water could have conceivably trickled into the vault to lift the coffins, which could then drift freely until it drained away. Of course, this doesn't explain any of the more violent movements of the coffins, such as that which belonged to Mary Chase, nor does it explain transpositions, such as Thomasina Clark's wooden, and thus likely more buoyant, coffin suddenly appearing underneath Samuel Brewster when the vault was opened for the last time. It is possible that local topography funneled more water into the vault than would be normally expected. It is also possible the drawings indicating the ultimate positions of the coffins are inaccurate, but this seems unlikely given the amount of scrutiny the vault was given. Could the answer be geophysical? The island of Barbados does lie within a highly active seismic belt, at the edge of a tectonic plate. There are even several active volcanoes in the region, La Soufriere on the island of St. Vincent being the closest, at just over 100 miles to the west. Also, the Lesser Antilles, the archipelago of which Barbados is a member, frequently experiences earthquakes, some as large as 6.0, enough to move a house, let alone a coffin. But as promising as the theory seems, there is very little evidence of earthquakes hitting the island during the months or years that the vault remained in state. The idea that a tremor powerful enough to throw lead coffins several feet would not be independently noted seems to strain credulity. There is also the plain fact that no other vaults on the island, even those in the same cemetery as the Chase Vault, ever experienced similar phenomena. In 1957, author Eric Frank Russell noted in regards to the drawings made during the 1820 opening, Quote, the picture they present is that of a swirl or a spiral effect, like so many metal shapes spun around by some force, gravitational, gyroscopic, electromagnetic, unquote. 
Russell's observation of the coffin's seemingly slow creep and his mentioning of electromagnetism are quite perceptive and do have a much stronger connection to reality than sweat explosions. Contrary to what is commonly believed, non-magnetic, even non-metallic objects can be levitated in a magnetic field. Atoms are, in a way, tiny magnets, regardless of their type. When placed in a strong enough magnetic field, anything from gold coins to drops of water to even living frogs can be levitated. But the key phrase is strong enough. While the Barbados coffins could conceivably be lifted by some earthly magnetic field, the strength of the field in question would need to be many orders of magnitude beyond what occurs naturally. In the early 20th century, investigator Forster Allain examined vault records and local newspaper archives and found nothing to corroborate the story. However, an unpublished letter sent to Mr. Allain's own father by the aforementioned Nathan Lucas described witnessing the opening of the Chase Vault in April of 1820 and mentioned the dislocation of the coffins therein and even participation in the ad hoc investigation. Quote, I examined the walls, the arch, and every part of the vault, and found every part old and similar, and a mason in my presence struck every part of the bottom with his hammer, and all was solid. I confess myself at a loss to account for the movements of these leaden coffins." Unquote. Curiously, in his letter, Mr. Lucas also mentions another similar incident from five years prior in which coffins mysteriously moved, this time in the village of Stanton in Suffolk, England. This claim was later confirmed by Sir Algernon Aspinall as having seen print in the European magazine in the September 1815 issue, though this early date would seem to preclude the possibility that the story of the Stanton Vault somehow borrowed from Barbados, one should note the first activity mentioned in regards to the Chase Vault occurred in 1812 with the burial of Dorcas Chase. A British colony, Barbados was a center for agricultural export, particularly sugarcane. A memorable story such as the Chase Vault could easily have been disseminated across the empire, the admittedly chilling rumor passing between dock workers at various ports of call and family members back home. That the Stanton story was the first to be committed to paper doesn't speak to its originality, although the near simultaneousness of both events does seem odd. Stranger still, two other occurrences of moving coffins were briefly spoken of in later decades. In 1844, in the town of Arensburg on the Baltic island of Arsel, a tomb owned by the Buxhoveden family experienced coffins thrown about on several occasions, vampires and werewolves taking the brunt of the blame. A local baron was called in to lead an investigation. The entire floor of the tomb was even said to have been torn up in an effort to find a secret passageway. Eventually, ashes were spread around the tomb as a means of detection, though this precaution bore little fruit as the coffins once again seemed to move under their own power. Later, in 1867, a Mr. Paley, the son of a rector in Gretford, England, wrote briefly about both wood and lead coffins repeatedly moving in a local vault. Quote, Twice, if not thrice, the coffins in a vault were found on reopening it to have been disarranged. The matter excited some interest in the village, but I think it was hushed up out of respect to the family to whom the vault belonged. Unquote. One would be hard-pressed to conclude these two later occurrences are wholly original. Indeed, the Ehrensburg case in particular, which even includes a malicious patriarch committing suicide, virtually plagiarizes many details found in the Barbados account. In an article written for Fate magazine in 1982, investigator Joe Nickel reasons the story of the Chase Vault is more or less allegorical, a carefully crafted bit of symbology meant for the consumption of Freemasons. As evidence, he points to the curious use of language in Nathan Lucas's 1820 account. The terms vault, arch, and mason are found throughout Masonic texts, as are references to the striking of and sound of a hammer, which does seem to be given unusual prominence in the Lucas testimony. Though he doesn't dispute the existence of the people involved, Mr. Nickel points out that some of the men named in connection to the events in Barbados, as well as Arensburg, were Freemasons. Also of note is a particular reference made by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, a well-known Freemason, of the word effluvia. Quote, the word is well known to Masons, since it appears in the Master Mason degree. Not only that, but it does so specifically in reference to the grave." Unquote. But allegories generally have a purpose. One would think a Masonically symbolic tale would promote some Masonic ideal. As it is, the story seems rather pointless, like an Aesop fable existing only to make the world aware of talking wolves and hares. To claim a reference to a mason is symbolic, when it is equally possible the word was used to describe something literal, a person performing stonework, is hardly irrefutable. 
An arched ceiling may represent the royal arch of Masonic lore, and cement may represent the bond between brothers in a Masonic lodge, or they may represent sound structural engineering and the use of a tried and true method of construction employed since the Roman era. To be fair, the argument is a creative one and is seemingly supported by evidence, though one does wonder if such Masonic connections were found before or after a conclusion was formulated. And as Mr. Nickel himself points out, the Freemasons are not a secret society, but a society with secrets. Far more mystique is often attributed to the group than is likely deserved. Whether the Chase Vault was victim to a bona fide haunting or not is likely to remain a mystery for the foreseeable future. Perhaps the ultimate answer lies somewhere in between the bizarre and ordinary. Perhaps something odd but completely harmless and natural occurred in the Chase Vault and was later misinterpreted. Or perhaps the event was entirely fictitious, concocted for the enlightenment of Freemasons or as fodder for the gullible. Whatever the truth, we can be certain the story will remain a staple in the intellectual forests of the night, for there is no shortage of fertile ground in human fears of mortality and the unknown.